Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In today's episode, I want to review a paper that attempts to do something I think a lot of people are looking for, right? How do I take the basic research findings you know, around, for example, variability of practice and actually apply them, right? How do I know when to add variability, how much, so on, right? What type? So this paper is going to attempt to address all those questions. So the paper is Applied Model for Using Variability in Practice. And I thank the authors for sending me a preprint uh, advanced copy of this. It just recently came out. So this, this paper starts with a background of, you know, understanding the you know, research on variability of practice, right? And it starts with the idea that learning requires generalization, right? So we're going to learn in a very narrow range of cases, right? We're going to practice in a very narrow range of cases, and we need to generalize this to a uh, broader, right? Because broader range of context, because um, we're going to, plus in competition, you're going to face things that you, you can't possibly face everything in practice that you can face in, in competition, okay? So we can practice very few variants, but still successfully execute the non-trained variants because we generalize one trained variable distribution to a novel one. This is, you know, kind of, I, I start with a problem here. Uh, the concept of generalization is a very cognitive information processing idea, right? The idea that you start with the one correct technique and adapt, adjust it for the different variants you're going to face in competition. You know, this is something I covered. I'll talk about this more in a second. I have a blog post and I've covered in my book. Uh, first book, the adjustability versus adaptability role of variability, right? So starting off right from the start, I, you know, the generalization, I don't think that's what we're looking for in ecological dynamics. We're looking for degeneracy. We're looking for multiple solutions. We're looking for ability to solve problems, not for taking the one way we learn it and be able to adjust that, okay? Um, they also look at types of variability, and they identify four different types based on this work by a person named Ravi. Ravi, um, numerosity is when learning is based on the numbers, examples, practice. So we could vary if we're doing batting practice in baseball, we could vary projection speed, uh, location, trajectory if you're doing fielding practice. The more variance we add, the more variable the practice is, right? So if we have five different speeds and five different angles and five different trajectories, that could be high variability versus two of these, right? And I touched on this a little bit in my last episode with the volleyball, right? There was a very small number of variants, only three conditions, right? So that's what they mean by numerosity. Heterogeneity require, um, refers to how similar the movements are uh, for the different variants, okay? So in more heterogeneous practice, you have to do more diff different movements, okay? So hitting a specific volleyball, a specific uh, tennis ball to a target, Right, if you're allowing for both forehands and backhands to make the shot, that's more heterogeneous, right? They're 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 different than if you're doing only forehands. So we're not varying the number of conditions; we're varying the the difference between them, right? Between the movements involved. Uh, situational diversity relates to the environmental conditions in which the practice takes place. Um, we, we could have the same movement provided in a crowd, uh, snowy, icy, open water swimming, right? So we could have lots of different. Um, situational dis diversity. Uh, important concept that they touch on a little bit is some of these are going to be task relevant, some of them aren't, right? Whether you're playing on a green or gray playing surface has no relevance, right? Unless the ball, it's affecting the visibility of the ball, which in most cases it wouldn't. So it's really irre task irrelevant, okay? And finally, scheduling. That's the spacing or interleaving the practice, which is the bulk of the research is is on variability of practice is really referring to this, how we schedule practice, not the content so much, right? So we're going to, um, are we doing block practice, uh, serial practice, random practice? Um, we're bringing in contextual interference here, which I reviewed a couple uh, episodes ago, right? The re evidence for that. So we have these different types. So the authors kind of point out different, this, so this is showing the different ways we can create variability of practice. I think these are somewhat overlapping, but I think it's useful. It is useful to kind of think about the different ways we can do it. And the next thing they do in the paper is they show, they relate uh, variability to motor learning theories. And they basically show, and this is something I've said before, variability serves a purpose in no matter what theory of motor learning you subscribe to, we've accepted that variability is good. 
from Bernstein's theory of repetition without repetition. We have schema theory, um, you know, uh, Schmidt's motor programs, dynamical systems, ecological dynamics, challenge point and optimal theory, which I'm not sure are, are a contextual interference. So we have all these different theories pulling and they try to map on the different types of variability of talking about um, to these different theories, right? Which is ki kind of makes sense. Um, but the key point is, right, uh, all, no matter what you believe, I think we've come to the point that very, some variability is good. And this is something I've written about before, right? Where we differ is when and how variability is added. What's its purpose? So based on what its purpose is, it's going to determine how you add it. So, uh, so Bernstein's theory is based on heterogeneity, right? Repetition without repetition, that's essentially what we need, means. We need a different solution to solve the same so problem. Uh, advantage for variable practice was also predicted by Schmitz. Um, uh, we better learn the relationship, we better develop better motor programs, right? That's the basic idea of, that I talked about when I reviewed the contextual interference. We get more and uh, enriched uh, motor programs when we uh, vary things. And we're talking about numerosity and situational diversity. Okay. Ecological dynamics, the variability changes the informational landscape of affordances and guides the discovery of new solutions. Uh, result, numerosity, heterogeneity, and situational diversity are inherent in, in these theories. So they're trying to map these different types of variability onto these different theories. Um, challenge point and optimal theory plays a, a very important setting the right level of difficulty, right? This, um, that they're bringing, these two theories bring in the idea that variability changes difficulty, task difficulty and motivation and things like that. And you have to get that right. So there's kind of, they've kind of tied this all together in, in a pretty nice way, okay? Other things we can do, the contextual interference is where learning is presumed to benefit from the amount of interference that results from switching between different tasks. I reviewed that a couple episodes, the, re the relevance of that to sport context when we just compare the binary conditions of random versus block is a bit questionable. Um, low to high, depending on whether we're going to, um, you know, we get this traditional explanation that you, you know, suffer in the short term because you have this interference, but you get better in the long run. Contextual interference is an example of the scheduling type, right? So we're not varying the number of conditions or the, the similarity between them, we're varying the order and the, how they would fit together. Okay, so that's a kind of basic idea. Okay. And as I mentioned, here's one example of where I've talked about this, the how, why, and when we use variability in practice, showing that the two ways, yes, both, uh, it's, there's a place in all theories, like, like we said, but it's very different, right? Uh, and I bring up, I call it adjustability versus adaptability, right? Do you start with the one correct technique, the fundamentals, and then pe teach people to adjust that to fit to different, conditions they might face in practice, or do you add variability to produce adaptability, to develop the person as a movement problem solver, right? They're very, very different things in, in my mind, and you can read that if you're interested. Okay. So in terms of actually applying this and implementing variability of practice, right, they talk about the th three key principles, right? The first is level of difficulty, right? So we know there's lots of beneficial effects for a variability. But it also incre chain increases the level of difficulty when you vary things a lot, right? And this can get into issues of challenge point and optimal theory. Um, the um, the um, the uh, that the this is the, you know that they're motivational and 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 effects, right? It's variability of practice is not just for motor learning; it has motivational and things effects. That's something that those theories have emphasized really well. One of the kind of the issues that I have with this paper, and, and it's going to come out um, as they would go into more deep, is it's kind of a, a lot of these things start by taking a, a theoretical stance. They think, right, that, okay, all, variability is good for all. We can look at it. And then they say things like this a constant or block practice would provide novice adequate opportunities for learning, right? So they're starting with the fundamentals idea that you learn, which is, Fit, does not fit with ecological dynamics at all, right? So, but anyway, we need to, the idea you need to scale the variability to get the difficulty level right is one important point. The second thing, the important principle for how we use variability is managing expectations, right? Um, the the um, 
right? We need to keep the, you know, the in optimal, we have the enhanced expectations, enhanced learning. Um, they, so uh, on one hand, you know, the, and I've talked about this before, in, in block practice, people feel like they're learning, right? They're making gains, while others might become disillusioned in random practice, uh, leading to less effort and engagement, okay? Um, you need to take into account the learner's motivation and confidence, right? When you're using variability, you can't just throw them in into the conditions and, and if they're not going to respond. Okay. And the last principle they bring up is representative design. A third key principle for implementing variable practice, the task variation should be representative of the attendant performance context. In other words, training variations should simulate the contextual typical in, information that I was saying, provide athletes a couple of perception action through realistic situations. Okay, <laughs> here's one of my problems. I do not like this definition of representative design at all. Right, this is some people, this is specificity. It's not representative design. This is, uh, you know, I keep bringing this up. I, I think, you know, so to me, representative learning design, you're not trying to recreate competition exactly. You're trying to keep a small number of essential elements there. The information, right? The action fidelity, the afford, there's multiple affordances, right? Uh, these kind of things. Beyond that, anything goes in my mind. We don't, right? That's why practicing shooting with a large, like in baseball, we practice with a larger pitcher, so a smaller ball than normal and a larger ball than normal, right? Those are not situations that they're going to actually face. So we're not trying to get them to be able to do something in practice that they're going to face in a game. That's adjustability, right? We're trying to teach them adaptability, problem solving. We accept the idea by learning to do perform the skill with an object or, or facing constraints that you will never face in practice is beneficial, right? So I don't really like this this definition of representative design. To me, it's they're talking about specificity of practice here, right? Uh, representative design, as long as to me, as long as you have those key key components, anything goes, including things you'll never face in practice. There's benefits to having to perform the skill under conditions you'll never face in practice in the competition, right? So that, that's the you know, issue I have. So uh, from there, they talk about um, these, this idea of regulatory and non-regulatory conditions. Um, so they're talking about conditions that um, you can add that um, affect the specifics of the movement, while other things will not affect direct, it only affect it directly, such as fatigue, okay? Um, so regulatory conditions, you know, the weight of the ball, the length of a bat, for example, distance of a target, those are task relevant. They, they're directly going to change the movement pattern that you need, right? More force. Um, Non-regulatory conditions could, uh, different flooring, different lighting, they're going to affect the movement pattern, but in, more, in a more indirect way, right? So that, that's kind of a concept they bring into this as well. All right, so from there, they developed this applied framework for using variability in practice. So they're trying to answer those questions, how, what, where, when, and you know, why. Um, three key principles, level of test should, uh, should correspond with the athlete's optimal challenge point, right? Manage athlete's expectations according to a practice goal. Task variation should be representative of the intended part, right? So, you know, I already disagree with number three, right? There's, if you don't believe me, look at the vast research on differential learning, where you're going to have task variations that are not like competition at all. When does a soccer player ever make a shot with their arms behind their head or one eye closed, right? The purpose of variability is not to represent, is to create, is not to mimic a situation you're going to face in comp, it's to get you to problem solve, right? So, I, you know, there's the issue, right? So they've already you know, kind of led, led, leaned into one theoretical approach and ignored another, even though they, they're trying to remain a theoretical, okay? So when to add variables. So initially athletes must acquire the spatial temporal movement pattern, getting the idea of the movement, they call it, and learn to distinguish regulatory for long regulatory conditions. So they must, this is the fundamentals assumption, which last, you know, last couple of weeks ago I showed, doesn't seem to support need, if not all the tensional resources toward the execution of movement, that's an information processing idea. Consequently, an athlete should not only practice one skill at a time, should initially do so under conditions that do not require decision-making. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, uh, you're making me shudder here. Um, we're talking about uh, 
task decomposition and representation, reducing variability down. Once athletes have developed a movement pattern that allows for some degree of success, they enter the skill refinement stage. At this stage, very practices should be reduced. Um, right, so we're, this is the classic fundamentals idea. You need to learn the one movement pattern, then you learn to adapt it. If the goal of practice is to maintain athletes' current skills, develop automaticity, theory, information processing, in this skill or enhance expert success, decreased levels of variability should be used. So variability, again, it seems to be driven by these classic information processing ideas of the one correct technique, moving towards automaticity, things like that. Well, this, that interleaver ratio should be spirited. Other suggest the amount of context should be individualized, taking into account the skill level of the athlete, uh, supported by the challenge uh, point framework. Levels of contextual inferiority be systematically increased by reducing the size of the blocks of repetition and moving to a random schedule as learning progresses. So going through these stages of learning. So, you know, in ecological dynamics, we don't deny that you you can't you can't throw everything at the person. It's just the the different reasons for doing and scaling <coughs> are completely different. Right. So you have different view. <coughs> right. Um, so this, uh, you know, this is kind of classic. So here's the, here's their model. Where are you in, are you just starting out? You're getting the idea of movement, then we want no variability. So we have the fundamentals assumption, right? You need to learn the fundamentals under uh, prescription, low task decomposition, no decisions involved. Then we're gonna plug it back in and we're gonna refine it. This is where we, you know, <laughs> cognitive load to improve decision-making. Uh, attentional load, right? So we're adding in things. You know, so, so this, you know, this paper for me, I don't know, you know, what it's doing. It's an applied model of using variability based on information processing ideas. It's not a, like what I thought it was going to be when it started. A, a contemporary model that takes into account ecological dynamics, self organization. It doesn't do that at all. Right? It's very, very inform heavily information processing based. It's based on the idea of, uh, you know, using adjustability, right? So you can can have a look at it if you want, but I don't think there's anything super new here. Um, you know, here's a specific example for a tennis serve, what you can vary, um, you know, these, these showing how, you know, when to add variability and, and, and why. Um, there, there are also give a good examples of types of variability for uh, different sports, alpine skier, uh, soccer player, they divide these into non-regulatory and regulatory conditions, right? Ones that are, you know, I would call these, a lot of these are sort of individual, I would put these in individual or environmental constraints, things that have a general, these are all task constraints that are going to require a different, that's the way I would divide it up um, instead of this regulatory and non-regulatory way, okay? So that kind of sums up that paper. I, like I said, I, I, you know, I thought it was going to be one thing, and it kind of went to, into very traditional, classic ideas about motor learning, the fundamentals assumption, the idea of adjustability, the idea that you want to learn under essentially no variability conditions, no decisions first uh, before you add variability in, right? And like I said, there, you know, this nothing wrong with that. But just recognize that's one way to do it. The theories that they cite at the start, Bernstein and ecological dynamics, completely different function of variability, right? So it has completely different. That is why there's no one general applied framework for how to use variability. It, like everything, depends on the theory of motor learning you prescribe to, right? That's going to determine what you how you use variability. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for joining me. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.